Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. I'm really looking forward to introducing my guest to you today. He has a great story about leaving a faith based on hate to one marked by compassion and love. If you want to connect with Bleeding Daylight, you'll find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you like what you hear, don't keep it to yourself. Share Bleeding Daylight episodes with your friends. Chris Starron is an award-winning filmmaker, novelist, improv comedian and the producer and host of The Truce Podcast, which dives deep into history to explore how we got here and how we can do better. He's an author, the writer, director and producer of the films Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls. I'm very pleased that he's agreed to share some time with us today. Chris, welcome to Bleeding Daylight. Well, thanks so much for having me. We can learn so much about people from their early life. So I want to start here. Uh, Help me understand what growing up was like for you. Yeah, I I have two really great parents who are still together by the grace of God. And um, we attended churches and things and went to youth groups. My parents led youth group for a while. They were always the fun ones where it's like if there was a mess to be made, they were the ones making it. We'll make the mess and we'll apologize later if somebody's offended (laughs) kind of folks. Um, So they were always open to sort of creative expressions like that, though we did end up working a lot together. Uh, so our parents, my, my brother and I, uh, well, I have two brothers. Uh, our parents uh, were always um, refurbishing some kind of a house, rebuilding something, putting new siding on. Um, so we also worked really hard as, as a family, uh, always building the house, making it look nicer. We literally raised the level of the backyard by three feet, the entire yard. Just There was always a project to do. In In the course of that, I also listen to a lot of fundamentalist radio. I'm working on a series now for my show about fundamentalism. And I love the, the this definition that George Marsden uses. Uh, he's a like the go-to guy about Christian fundamentalism. And he says, fundamentalism is evangelicalism plus anger. And so I was listening to a lot of fundamentalist radio, which would be even evangel- evangelical but also plus anger or fear of like, you know, those people are coming to get us. So I kind of grew up on a steady diet of that. I mean, the good thing about it is that it makes you aware of your surroundings and, and, you know, what the possible tripping points are going to be for you, but it also can lead you to the place where you're suspicious when you don't need to be, or you're angry and you don't need to be. Now, on top of all the work ethic and things that my parents instilled in me, in me, there was this sort of undercurrent of of anger and fear of the other. That's interesting. And I want to delve into a couple of those terms that you've used because they have taken on different meanings over time. So firstly, there's that evangelical. We see that that's got a dirty name now. It, it used to be <laughs> the, these are people that you know want to go out. They want to share their faith. They, they have a, a a clear understanding of who God is and who they are. And now it's become something different. When did that change take place? Oh, well, you know, it's funny because it it comes and goes in waves. And so like the evangelical idea started out as sort of meaning all sort of Bible believing Christians. If you take the Bible seriously, you know, you believe in Jesus, all those kinds of things, you are an evangelical. And then eventually in the 1920s, when the term fundamentalist started being used, evangelical and fundamentalist became synonymous with each other for a while until you get to just before Billy Graham, where they started pulling apart away from each other again. And then uh, evangelical eventually meant anybody who agrees with Billy Graham is another uh, thing that George Marsden likes to say. You're an, you're an evangelical if you agree with Billy Graham. And then uh, when you got into sort of the 80s and 90s, the two started to match back up together. Uh, So it it became harder and harder to distinguish to now where there are a lot of Bible-believing Christians who 50 years ago would have been considering themselves evangelicals are now wrestling with this idea of, "Am, am I really an evangelical or do we need another term? So just like a lot of things in history, they kind of come and go in waves. And that, that, that term evangelical falls in and out of favor. And now it's falling out. 
And that term fundamentalist is an interesting one as well, because yeah. I would say that I believe the fundamentals of the faith, but that's not what the term is meaning. And we think of right. fundamentalists in other faiths, and they are the people that are, are doing horrific things. And then we see Christian fundamentalism has taken on a, a bit of that shade, hasn't it? It really does. And that's it's unfortunate because, again, it's one of those things that it comes and goes in waves where there are times where fundamentalists actually make a lot of sense. If you go into the 1880s, uh, the fundamentalist movement, uh, it wasn't yet called the fundamentalist movement because the term was invented in the uh, 1920s or it became into popular use in the 1920s. But sort of the undercurrent that led up to that, uh, you can see how uh, it made sense because the world was changing so fast. Uh, there, there's this saying that the person of 1850 had more in common with the year zero than the year 1900 uh, because the, the technology and things had changed so quickly, even though it was only 50 more years until 1900, uh, they had so much more in common with the year zero because the year zero, they were also using horses for things. It was also very hard to get information out there. You weren't using machines in general. Um, whereas in 1900, you were using lots of machines. And so that ramp of, of technology created this fear of, of change. So there were a lot of movements in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, where fundamentalists were actually involved in a lot of sort of almost, dare I say, kind of progressive things. As time went on, it kind of fell into a very dark place, especially in the 1920s as uh, there was a lot of anti-Catholic uh, Catholic sentiment, a lot of anti-Jewish sentiment, a fear of Germans, uh, because, of course, we just fought a world war against the Germans. And um, so there was, a, there was a lot of fear creeping in. Also with Darwinism, there, so there were a lot of things to be very afraid of back then. So it, it kind of comes and goes. And again, you know, yes, it's fine. Uh, it's understandable now because you don't want we none of us really want to be living in a place where we're constantly angry or be defined by our anger like fundamentalists are. You can see at certain points throughout history where fundamentalism made sense in the Christian sphere. Uh, right now, though, it really has bred a lot of that sort of negativity, the hostility, the anti-science movement, especially around things like COVID. Uh, you, you can see how that has led to very destructive things. And so this is the kind of diet that you were growing up on through yeah. the radio, taking this on board. <laughs> tell, tell me a little about that because we all have different experiences of the, the sorts of influences. How did that start to influence you? It, it had a lot of very good influences because I was getting a steady diet of very godly biblical teaching, which was awesome. But there's also sort of this general negativity. And so one of the markers of Christian fundamentalism is the idea that the world is getting progressively worse. And you see that through ideas like premillennialism, uh, which is that uh, uh, the world is going to get worse. And then there's Jesus will come back. Where, uh, whereas there's also an idea of like postmillennialism where the world is going to get better and that will usher in Jesus coming back. Uh, so there are different ideas in Christianity. Also the idea of dispensationalism, that the world is divided up in all these different eras. And one of the last eras that we're in now is where the church is eventually going to become apostate and is going to turn uh, backwards and, and reject God eventually. Uh, so there are all these sort of dark movements that I was hearing on fundamentalist radio that the world was progressively getting worse and that, you know, Christians around the world were turning against God. And so that creates um, not only a fear of the other, that there is a, those people are coming for us. And the idea of those people changes throughout time and, you know, whatever movement, wherever you are, there was also that idea that our people are turning away from God. And so there was a, a looking out for uh, apostasy within your own church, within your own small group, um, high school groups, you know, I was always kind of, kind of preparing myself for people to backslide. And so that, it creates sort of a, an us and them thing that can be very unhealthy. So maybe I, I didn't really ever feel like I, there was an assurance, you know, that there's that song that goes, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I never, I, I always struggled with that because there was always this idea that it could all fall away. Uh, and that, that creates a very sort of negative mindset for a Christian. And there's also this idea that we're the only ones that have got it right. There, there's a right. handful of us. We've got <laughs> it right. So the guys that you're listening to on the radio, they've got it right. And if you follow them, you've got it right. But everyone else is in error. How do we walk the balance between that sort of thinking that 
most everyone is wrong and actually holding to true doctrine and correct theology? Where do we draw that line? Boy, that's such a big question, isn't it? I, I think, of course, the, 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 the obvious answer is you have to read the Bible and, and figure out when somebody quotes something to you and says, the Bible says this about this subject, read what comes before it and what comes after it. Uh, generally, a lot of those things you can fact check pretty quickly by just getting a little bit of context. I, I think the other thing is to understand, and this, this can seem kind of like anathema to fundamentalists, but uh, you have to understand that the world is very complex. A lot of the subjects I cover on Truce, my podcast, uh, the, the goal of the ab- episode is generally to suss out the reality that a con- uh, something that we think is very black and white is actually very complex. So you have to hold on to the, the truth of the Bible, that there are things that the Bible is very clear are sins, but there are also a lot of things that are you know matters of opinion, uh, sort of like political parties. Like I, I would never go so far to say that like political party A is the party of God because no, it's a political party, you know, and they're going to have to, you know, fix things like, should we repair the sewers or shouldn't we? You know, there is no biblical command to fix the sewers. So it's like you're, you're on your own, you know? Um, so don't, don't call those things biblical commands if they're not biblical commands. Uh, so there, that's one of the, the, the main things is to be able to suss that out. Plus uh, the reality of trying to share your faith in a way. Another thing that'll help is share your faith in a way where you're not trying to knock somebody down, but just to share the faith with them, you know, just to tell the truth and, and ask yourself when you're doing that, am I actually loving this person? Uh, do I actually really care who this person is, what they think about, what their passions are, what their dreams are, or am I kind of just accomplishing something? Am I going to be, you know, go back to my church and be able to brag about this moment? Is that my real motivation or is my motivation to really invest in this person? Because that that little soul search on your own can really give you an idea of where you are. One of the things that made a big difference for me was actually building relationships with people who I grew up listening to Christian radio, hearing about as those people to watch out for. And yeah, I mean, they were into things that I had no business getting involved in and had to draw lines between me and them. But I also, in order to be able to share the gospel with them, I had to love them and build a relationship with them. And that was one of the things that really broke down a lot of those fundamentalist walls for me. Tell me about that turning point. Where did that come? Where there's this strange disconnect in your mind between what you've been told through this Christian radio and what you're actually experiencing. How did that happen? Yeah, you know, it was actually, it was a long period of time. Uh, if I'm being honest, I, there was no moment <laughs> where things, where the lights came on or something. But it was, it was a long period of time where I was, I went to a secular college, Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. It, just in the process of getting to know people, I, I would just build relationships in classes. But also, I had a, a, a mentor who was working for Campus Crusade back then. It's now called Crew. He would go to people's dorm rooms, uh, knock on the door and visit them. And that was like his whole ministry. And in the course of that, he would um, build relationships with people, share the gospel with them. And also uh, our meetings started out being on Friday nights because that's you know when a lot of students had time off. But then uh, his name was Craig and Craig decided, you know, we're not going to do our meetings on Friday nights because that's when we should be out with people. You know, like that's when the parties are going on. That's when the get-togethers are happening. People are going to the movies. That's where we should be. You know, we should be out there. So we'll, we'll meet on Mondays and Tuesdays when nobody's having a party. And uh, that was a huge thing for me just to realize even my schedule could create this sort of us and them border between me and other people. You know, because on Friday nights, I'm so sanctified. I'm, I'm going to go to Campus Crusade <laughs> and, and instead of, you know, going out and being out with friends. And then throughout the course of that, with his encouragement, I was, I was going to parties and I wasn't drinking. I wasn't, uh, you know, getting involved in things I shouldn't get involved in, but I was out investing in people. I, I was a designated driver for some people. When I moved to Los Angeles, uh, I was working in the film industry, which, you know, a lot of people would, I, it, we, we can draw some really harsh lines and call it like the devil's playground and stuff, but it, you'd be amazed at what the actual demographics of the, the film industry are and what the people are actually like. But in, in the course of being out there, 
um, I got to kind of experience sort of what once I got out of the safe environment of college where people are you know, very tolerant of your, you and all that, I, I got out into the working world. I could see that there were some people who were very angry at me just for being a Christian. We hadn't really worked together yet or anything. I, I hadn't done anything to offend them, really. It was just my existence did offend them. Uh, and then I could also, rather than fight back like I was maybe raised to on Fundamentalist Radio, I, I could love them and then also do my job in such a way that they couldn't argue with my performance. And that that was an, also a really good way to kind of break off um, some of those, those chains that uh, fundamentalism put on me. Did it ever strike you as interesting in that moment when there's these people in the film industry who hate you because you're a Christian and you're yeah. thinking, that's not right? Did it ever occur to you, hey, that's what I've been doing in the past, hating people just because they're not like me? <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, and it's funny, it was it was very few people who were like that. Um, there, there was one guy in particular on a film set, uh, on a reality show I worked on in the camera department, and he was one of the sound guys, and he got like right up in my face during a lunch break. And I thought it was really funny because uh, during lunch, I would often sit next to a Muslim guy, and I would pray to God, and he would pray to, you know, Allah. And, and I would give him rides home. Like he and I actually, actually were friends on set. And then this, the sound guy gets in my face, um, about how intolerant I am. I'm like, but I'm the one who's actually sitting at a table with a Muslim guy <laughs> you know, and giving him rides home. And you're, you're the one in my face. Uh, so I think it, it, by that time I had started to realize when somebody acts out like that, they're often coming from a place of hurt. You know, he had no frame of reference for who I am. We barely worked together at that point. And I had, you know, hadn't really even told them about my faith much. So it was really important for me by then to understand when somebody was angry at me, especially very angry at me, they were often coming from a place of hurt and probably not for anything I did, um, but just some other idea they came into the relationship with. So hopefully um, that can breed, you know, breed compassion within us. I imagine we could have a whole program on assumptions because this guy is, <laughs> because you have this label of Christian, he's assuming that you think yeah. like this, you act like this, and and yet so many Christians, especially those that would call themselves fundamentalists, they're assuming something about other people, and and therefore right. we don't get the opportunity to enter into their world and to share with them the hope that we have. Right? Isn't that funny? It's the it's the the thing that we very much want because again. Fundamentalists are evangelicals. That means we want to share our faith. We're evangelistic. But then you add that anger thing in it, and it can actually get in the way of the evangelical part of you. It can actually block your evangelism and your your sharing your faith. Um, so yeah, it's funny. Uh, those two things are always in conflict when you're uh, in a fundamentalist. And partially, there's that desire to say, if they hate us, we must be doing something right. <laughs> Which, uh, you know... There, it can be truth to that. If you are living a godly, loving life, maybe somebody's going to hate you. But sometimes when people react very negatively, right, they hate you, it could be because you're being a jerk. And we're, we're often not open to that idea that, that our actions can really speak louder than our words. So during that time in the film industry in LA, as yeah. well as having those occasional people who hate you simply because of the label that they put on you, I'm sure there are opportunities for, for great gospel conversations. Yeah, you'd be amazed. Um, it, it would just come up. And uh, my brother and I, again, we're, we're twins, and we, we lived together. We worked on a lot of sets together. Uh, by the grace of God, it would just come up sometimes, and it just kind of naturally in situations where even we had Christian friends that would work on a set for months, and nobody knew they were Christians, and then we'd be on there for a day or two, and it would just come out like... I was uh, that same reality show where that guy got in my face. The, the director of the show would take lunch breaks with me, and he, I almost became his confessor. And he was probably in his fifties, um, and I was you know twenty two, <laughs> and he just like started confessing things to me. All of a sudden, it, it was almost like the Holy Spirit had put something on his heart, and he 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 just was looking for somebody to to unburden him. Um, it was kind of an interesting opportunity there. The Hollywood is a huge mission field. It's a huge mission field. I mean, of course, there's, it's full of temptations and it's very, there are very long hours and you're always on the road. It's almost like a circus life. Uh, but it is a tremendous, tremendous mission field because people are hungry. 
that's a lot of times they they go into the film industry because they think that 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 hole inside of them is going to be filled by celebrity or you know fame or money or working on a notable project um, doing something big but but we all know that that's that's not what fills holes truly only only Jesus can and when we start to see other people as other people rather than yeah. the enemy we we start to see that there's there's a yearning for the same sorts of things that we yearn for, that that completeness, that wholeness. What am I here for? And as Christians, we should have the answer. Yeah, exactly. And if, you, if you're available, I really, I encourage people to even pray within a moment and just be like, God, is there something you want me to be doing right now? Is there somebody you want me to be seeing right now? Um, I just got back from a podcast conference a few weeks ago, and uh, I was just wandering around the conference floor praying like, okay, God. There's thousands of people around. Is there somebody here you want me to talk to? And I, th- I think it's a really healthy habit for us uh, to be open to build new relationships rather than to be afraid of folks. And uh, and then in within those relationships, to then, of course, then be able to share the gospel while also staying true to the teachings of the Bible and the, the moral aspects of that as well. You don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is usually what people are afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> when you're saying like, oh, I, I was raised in a fundamentalist radio, by radio, fundamentalist radio. My parents, I don't think really were fundamentalist, but I think the radio was. And that was where I was getting my Bible teaching from. If you can put aside what they teach you about the fear and hold on to sort of the, the strong, strong relationship with the Bible, I think you've got a great basis to build on. And you, you've touched on the fact that we seem to be more divided these days. And a yeah. lot of that comes along political lines. And I know that's more so in the US where you are. It's starting to happen here in Australia. And certainly there are listeners of Bleeding Daylight in various countries, and we see it in various places where rather than lining up behind our faith and our beliefs, we're lining up behind political systems or political parties. And then we're kind of using that as the yardstick rather than our faith. How did that come to happen? Oh, man. It depends on how far back you want to go. I mean, do you want to go back to Constantine? (laughs) 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 Because we can't. I mean, it's like in the years, I want to say in the 300s, that's when Christians went from being a persecuted people to being the favored people of the Roman Empire, like the the, the folks that ruled Western civilization. And and ever since then, uh, it's been a battle on and off. Um, and that waxes and wanes as it goes through. Um, and there are always going to be periods when you can say, oh, that, that was an era when Christianity had a big influence. Uh, in the United States, that tends to be the 1950s that people hold up as as this era of godliness in the United States. And th- I mean, there was a lot of very public religion. Uh, God was added to our money. Uh, he was added to our Pledge of Allegiance. There was the National Day of Prayer was created, the National Prayer Breakfast, all of these big movements. At the same time, we were experiencing Jim Crow laws where, you know, we were treating African Americans with complete and utter disrespect or, and and women as well. I mean, uh, it was very difficult to be a woman and get a job outside of maybe being a secretary or, uh, you know, cleaning something. Uh, So for every era that you look at when Christianity was on top, (laughs) <laughs> there, was, there was probably something else going on. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a fascinating thing because um, Christianity was very much a part of politics in the 1950s in the United States um, with uh, the threat of communism, which you know was, was a godless system. There were two magazines in Russia called, uh, or in the Soviet Union, called godless uh, going at the same time. They were very much about being anti religion in, in the Soviet Union. So there was also this, this big push in the United States to be like, well, if they are going to uh, tie themselves to um, communism and atheism in Russia, then we should tie ourselves to capitalism and Christianity in the United States. Yeah, that, that was a, a moment where it was very strong. And of course, a lot of political leaders tie themselves to their faith. So it's, it's really rare in the United States for a presidential uh, nominee to say that they are something other than some form of Christian, because it is still very much ingrained in the United States, uh, even even today, even as contentious as things are. Uh, like people on both sides will claim the name of Jesus. 
it's hard to say when it began. It just sort of waxes and wanes, which makes me like a really unspectacular guest, I think, on podcasts sometimes <laughs> because I, I'm always deflating people, you know, because I want to say, well, yeah, maybe with Jerry Falwell and the moral majority and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s in the United States. Yeah, that's that's when people usually want to tie it to. But no, it's it's been going on since Constantine. It just waxes and wanes over time. And it depends on what your viewpoint is to whether or not you think that's a good thing. And a lot of times, I, I think that it's best for Christians to acknowledge that p- politics is important to be involved in. Um, but at the same time, if that's where your hope lies, then your faith is going to be pretty dead. You're probably going to end up being more of a jerk than you want to be <laughs> in a lot of instances. If you see your eternal goal as you know converting somebody to your political party instead of loving people as Jesus loved them. And that's the struggle, isn't it? That we see people who are wanting to bring in sort of political might. They're wanting to change the nature of a country by legislation. So they're they're almost bringing in a morality without the basis to it. They're bringing in a biblical morality or a Christianity without Christ. And rather than actually seeing people come to Christ, they want to see people come to that morality first, and that will satisfy them. We we all, depending on what we believe uh, about about God, about other people, the value of human life, those kinds of things, uh, we all have different ideas, and they are going to be infused with our uh, our political beliefs and our religious beliefs, and we're all going to want to sort of legislate our thing. And uh, legislation in general of any kind is going to be based on some form of morality. Uh, whether that is, you know, do we tax these people or do we tax those people? There are moral questions involved with those things. Uh, so I think it, in a way, it's it's going to be very difficult for us to pull our faith outside of our political connections. Um, but also we can't, it, we're going to hurt ourselves a lot and we're going to hurt our witness to the world a lot if we are trying to legislate sort of the uh, moral perfectionism rather than share the gospel through our lives. You know, if that if our, if forcing the world to look like we want it to be, and by the way, this is the kind of the topic of my novel. If we're trying to force the world to look like we want it to be, we're going to hurt our witness. Uh, but if we instead love people the way that Jesus loved them, uh, we're going to help our witness tremendously. And then a lot of those other things that we fight so much about will kind of fall away. And it seems that through this journey that you've been on, through this fundamentalism to start with and then to start to understand people as people rather than the other, you've developed this this compassion that seems to be strangely absent. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Well, I should say, by the way, uh, I struggle just as much as anybody to be compassionate. (laughs) Get me on the phone with a a telemarketer or, uh, you know, a, a, a tech help line. And uh, you'll watch me lose my cool, but um, yeah, but but sure, surely there's something in the Bible that excuses that, isn't there? For, for those guys, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a special yeah, there's a special blessing for that. It, it has changed my mind a lot, um, especially getting to know people on a deeper level and seeing where they've come from and what makes them what they are. I think one of the the great evangelistic tools, and I, I'm a one of those people that I think that a lot of different evangelistic tools work in their own way at their own time. So I'm fine with somebody screaming on the street corner if that's what God told them to do, because believe it or not, that sometimes works. Um, or movies sometimes work. Songs. I have a little old lady in my church who um, was she was became born again when she heard a Christian a Christian song in a grocery store play just over the loudspeaker. Um, so you just kind of never know what's going to work. But at the same time, I personally found that the best way for me to share my faith is by getting to know what makes a person tick, how they got to be where they are, and where Jesus fits into all of that stuff, where God fits into all those things. Because if you come at somebody who has a lot of church hurt and you just start yelling at them, (laughs) you know, you're going to exacerbate the church hurt and you're not going to bring any kind of healing into that relationship. Uh, So for me, it seems like my, my ministry has been mostly trying to work within that, within people's existing hurts and pains and baggage and those kinds of things. That's where I I kind of see my show fitting in, is addressing a lot of these sort of things that we carry with Christianity and trying to figure out, does this thing belong there? How did it get there? And how can we do better? It's made me much more compassionate, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I can be a terrible hypocrite on my own right 
because I'm a human being. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, as the Bible says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm part of all. And because I like to ask you the really easy questions. Oh, good. How do, we, <laughs> how, how do we start to bring Christians back to that place of compassion? I mean, we see it in the story of the Good Samaritan where it's like the, the priest and the Levite, they just walk by. They, they don't care about this guy. And, and yet it's someone who is part of the other, a Samaritan. The, the, the Samaritans and Jews hated each other. And yet it's the Samaritan that shows compassion, which goes against everything that people would have believed in the day. Yeah. How do we actually start calling people back to that sense of compassion? There's so many different ways to do it. Um, I tend to think if there is somebody that you're very afraid of, well, or a type of person you're very afraid of, that may be the person that God wants you to love. In your quiet time, in your prayer time, in your journaling, try to figure out who is it that I'm afraid of. And then specifically pray for that group of people. Or if you know somebody who fits in that category, pray for that specific person. And then start figuring out how can I bless that person in whatever state they're in, whatever stage they're in, what, what they're going through. How, how can I bless them as a person? Part of what I think is great about prayer is that it creates this sort of relationship between us and God. But then also when we are praying for our enemy as we're commanded to, then we build a a relationship with them, even though they they may not know it. <laughs> it we build a compassion for the people that those, those people. So I, I think that that's sort of a really great first step. The other thing that I, I think is really important, so many Christians that I know are so comfortable. Um, and I think that that comes with economics, that comes with their tight social groups that they never leave. I think there is a certain need for especially American Christians to get out of our comfort zone or first, maybe first world Christians to get out of our comfort zone and start ha uh, seeing other kinds of people, um, especially like different economic demographics than us. Uh, you know, some, some people like never come in contact with somebody who is of another economic class unless they're serving them at a restaurant or maybe it's their employees. You'll, you'll never cross that line. So I think uh, it was also really important to build connections with people in other economic circles as you, as well as other ethnicities as you. Uh, that, that can be very important. And again, a lot of that can be built up by just praying for those people or starting to pray for those people and then watch as God opens those doors. How do we build compassion for someone else when they are someone that holds to the same faith we do? We see a lot of disagreement at the moment, and I know that this comes yeah. back to this question of fundamentalism, but how do we actually show compassion and love for, for a fellow Christian who holds a diametrically opposed view on some of the, the current things that are going on? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's a really good question, Rodney. Um, I, I want to ask you a question, I guess. Um, have you ever been afraid of something? Oh, Absolutely. I'm terrified Absolutely. of heights. I mean, there's, there's, there's a fear straight away. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you you know what it's like to be afraid of something. You've you've been in that position. So you can understand how debilitating it can be, how if you're at the at the top of a, a, a building or a, you know, a, a cliff edge or something, how you would do anything to get away from that fear, right? You're going to try to preserve yourself. Oh, and yeah. a, lot, a lot of what uh, somebody who is in that sort of fundamentalist or angry mode, you have to remember that they are afraid of something. And so they may not be acting just as you at the, the top of a cliff may do something somewhat irrational, like clawing your way, you know, across your loved ones to get away from the cliff. Uh, that's kind of what they're doing. So you, it helps to have some kind of idea that they're starting from a place of fear. And so even you getting in their face about something, some political issue or whatever, is, is just going to clam them up more. If nothing else, start from that same place of prayer and, and journaling and think, how can I bless that person? And because um, we are, you know, we're supposed to bless those who curse us. How can I bless that person? And then slowly throughout your relationship, try to love on them. So maybe they'll start to see, oh, wow, I, you know, Rodney's not as afraid of this thing as I am. And he really is loving people. And there's a, there's a difference. And then there are, of course, going to be those times in that relationship when you build it uh, prayerfully that, you know, a, a, an important subject will come up and you can be like, you know what, 
you, you really don't have to be afraid of, you know, people who wear masks or people who look differently than you. You know, you can bring those things up with inside that relationship. Um, so I think that 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 level of prayer really, really helps as a, as a starting point. I guess in my mind, I, I start to think of of certain scriptures, and I know that we can all take scriptures from various places to support what we're doing yeah. or support our agenda. But you know, I, I'm reminded often of, of Micah six eight. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. I, I yeah. realize that in scripture we're talking about Jesus as the Prince of Peace, and I'm wondering sometimes whether we don't feel that peace we've got to check ourselves and say why aren't i feeling that peace why aren't i walking humbly with my god and 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 to to love kindness what why is that not the state for me yeah that's an important question to ask you know uh, and of course we're all we all have restless periods of our lives i'm, I'm going through one right now uh but uh, yeah if we're if we find that we're constantly angry at a group of people I think that really is a good time to ask why, uh, to pray about it, and then w- ask how can I bless those people? Because um, it's it's hard to hate somebody when you're blessing them. So you, you're talking about this sense of compassion that we have when we start to, to love the other, when we start to pray for the other. And I believe that that praying for those that we see as different, as, as you've already mentioned, is one of those things that doesn't just bring some sort of effect in their life, but it changes our heart when we allow God to change our heart. And maybe part of the secret is to constantly ask God, is this someone I should be angry at? Oh, I absolutely. Of course. Um, you know, and again, also, like I said, understanding what makes somebody angry and why they're, why they're coming from the position that they're coming from. Because if you can understand where they're coming from, I think that you can have a lot more compassion. It's one of the reasons I'm working on a series about fundamentalism in the United States um, up until 1925 during the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, is that I want my listeners to understand fundamentalism and also not be afraid of it um, and, and understand the logic that goes into it. Because there is a certain amount of logic. It, it, it makes sense. It just isn't biblical. <laughs> and if you, if it, to me, if I can understand how somebody got to a certain point, then that builds compassion for me when I have to deal with them. You've mentioned a few times your podcast, Truce Podcast, and I'm sure that after hearing you, a number of our listeners are going to want to listen to Truce Podcast. Where can people find you? Sure. You can find me on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at at Truce Podcast or at trucepodcast.com. There you can also find links to my book, Cradle Robber, and my movies, Bringing Up Bobby and Between the Walls. And it sounds like we really need to get together again sometime to to start to discuss those movies and the books, and there's a whole lot more to say, but it's been a delight to chat to you today. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for your time on Bleeding Daylight. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net.